You're in the loop. We're here to discuss the ups, downs, and sideways of the sport of figure skating, and maybe give you plus five GOE along the way. Let's introduce this week's hosts. Hi, I'm Kite, and I can't believe the Junior Grand Prix is over and the Senior Grand Prix starts in less than two weeks. You can find me on Twitter at Mossy Zinc. What's up? I'm Evie, and I'm back for the third time to yell about all my precious children. You can find me on Twitter at Double Flux. Yay, we're back to talk about some more kids. Woohoo! It's just the two of us this week. Just the two of us here to talk about the last two Junior Grand Prix of this year, which are Croatia and Enya. We're going to be talking about all the things that happened uh, in the last two Junior Grand Prix of the season. And, you know, we know the qualifiers for the final now. So we're going to be talking in depth about, you know, the matchups and what we can expect because there's going to be a lot. I think it's going to be exciting. It'll be great. It'll be a time. And let's uh, start off our discussion by talking about the pairs. And I'm going to get through all of the names (laughs) very quickly, (laughs) as fast as possible. There was only one pairs event. Uh, The last pairs event was Croatia. The gold medalists, uh, we have Yulia Atimova and Mikhail Nazarishev of Russia. In uh, silver, we have Diana Mukhamitsnyanova and Ilya Mironov, also of Russia. And then with the bronze medal, we have Annika Hock and Robert Kunkel of Germany. Yeah. Yeah, we've got our podium. Woohoo. And actually, funnily enough, all three of these teams uh, with their med- respective medals here qualified to the final, which is fun times. So we definitely get to see them again, which will be exciting. I don't think it was a surprise to anyone that this was the podium <laughs> at this event. Yeah. I think it was, you know, like most junior pairs competitions, the field was pretty shallow. I think just looking at the entries before, and I was like, oh yeah, okay. Well, I know that at least like these two Russians are probably going to make the podium. The third spot, question mark, question mark. Yeah, the Germans. A bit of a surprise this season, I think. This event was obviously pretty small, considering it was a junior <laughs> pairs event, uh, but but, you know, there's still things to talk about. And I think in particular, like one of the standouts for me at this event was actually properly watching Diana and Ilya's performances because like during Chelyabinsk, like I was traveling, Kite, you were traveling as well, you know, <laughs> we were both going places. I personally didn't have a lot of time to catch up with the Tudor Grand Prix and I kind of like blitz through their performances kind of half watching it really quickly <laughs> during Chelyabinsk. And so I came, like I watched all of Croatia pairs live this time. And so I actually, you know, sat down and watched their skating. And I was really, really surprised by them because I really like enjoyed their their programs and their performances in general here. I think they're a really fun kind of team. Yeah, I definitely, their short program was, was something special. I don't really know how I feel about it. It's very like almost screamo-y at some point. <laughs> yeah, the music choice was so weird, but kind of like, I didn't mind the fact that it was weird. They kind of pulled it off. They're continuing the trend of like Russian pairs having very like funky, weird music. Like we had like Jungle Russians last season or like Party Like a Russian from Mission to Kalyabov, their short program. That was a great program. That was a 10 out of 10 program. And now we have, yeah, this weird screamy folk music. I'm down. And then uh, uh, their free skate was chess as well. And I really like the musical chess. So, I, and I'm upset we haven't had more like rhythm dances to chess. So this is a good, you know, placeholder program for that, I guess. I love that they like committed so much to the aesthetic of chess that they wore like chess boards. Yeah, they wore, like, on they their costumes. wore chess boards. That is dedication. Dedication to the theme. <laughs> I respect this. Listen. But, like, also the their elements were, at first, really kind of shocking because, you know, they do a throw triple lutz in both programs, and then in the free skate they do side-by-side triple lutzes and, and side-by-side triple flips, which you don't really see in either junior or seniors. So I was just like, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, wait a second, was that a, a lutz in pairs? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't really know about the history of uh, Diana and Ilya, or if they were in singles before they paired up, but definitely something really rare to see. Yeah, and it's like, it's a pretty smart move, though. Like, it's, it's definitely more like a high-risk, high-reward kind of gamble on the fact that you're doing a bit more riskier elements, but, you know, if they pull it off, they obviously can rack up more points than the other skaters, and while they didn't get the gold here, they did win the short program. With not much of a lead over uh, <laughs> Artemiva and Nazarichev. But, you know, another interesting thing to note was the fact that, like, no skaters, like, 
in the on the podium here got above a level two on the twist and like that's been a thing throughout this like whole Junior Grand Prix season I don't think I've seen a single pairs team get a level four on the twist which you know is a little bit worrying I'd like to personally see some better levels on this wouldn't we all maybe going into the final we'll get some and speaking of the final let's talk about what the pairs at the Junior Grand Prix final is going to look like. Uh, Kite, did you want to say the qualifiers? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> so our qualifiers for the pairs event at the Junior Grand Prix final, we have uh, Penfilova and Rilov of Russia, Atomiva and Nazarichev, also of Russia, Akinteva and Kolosov, guess what? Russia, Mukamitsyanova and Mironov. I won't be- you won't believe this, but they are Russian. <laughs> we have Hock and Kunkel, who are German. And then last but not least, we have Pepeleva and Pleshkov, which Da, 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 Russian. <laughs> you sounded almost so dejected when you said German. It's like, oh, we were close to having a Russian sweep. It is the same makeup as last year, except instead of a U.S. team, it's a German team. And remember, Kostya Kovic and Elin also set out the Junior Grand Prix. Um, otherwise, it probably would have been an all-Russian Junior Grand Prix in pairs, which is completely unsurprising, at least to me. I mean, other feds really kind of need to step up their pairs game in general. We don't. Re- we rarely see non-Russian teams make the podium like consistently and you know that's pretty worrying just looking at the future of the discipline I I mean I, I know it's a lot of effort especially for smaller federations or feds that might be more like focused in on singles to get you know funding together and teams together but guys it's pairs please <laughs> I mean okay so honestly I'm not sure how much good it would do at this point for other feds to like if they really wanted to like challenge Russian and like to some extent Chinese dominance in pairs because those two countries are just so far ahead since they spent like decades developing their pairs fields and like investing all of these like resources into them and even if other feds wanted to start catching up now, I think it'd be a long time before they could even get to that level. So I'm like, not really, like, I'm not really sure what they could do at this point. So I don't necessarily blame them for being like, okay, well, we might as well like invest all of like that energy into into dance, into singles, since those are fields in which like, you know, we have a better chance of winning. But yeah, I mean, I would like to see, you know, more diversity in the pairs field in terms of nationality. And there was like Chinese pairs on the Junior Grand Prix did do decently uh this season i think like the chinese there's a chinese pair who's th- third alternate for the final and i mean like sui and han obviously are the top pairs team in the world right now they're the reigning world champions so china definitely you know knows what they're doing with pairs it's just it'd be nice that they could extend that more into juniors yeah they've definitely got some really good talent in juniors at the moment like obviously wang jia who are the you know third alternates but there's also a couple of teams that really caught my eye this season like wang huang i really really liked seeing them they're very kind of unpolished in terms of their elements right now but they're a pretty new team I look at them and I see something that once it's developed could really be like they could become a really standout team and I really want to see how they grow in the next couple seasons that's with me with a lot of kind of juniory baby teams I'm like you'll you're decent now but like in a couple seasons I'd really like to see where you can go from there but yeah like what you said kind of about just developing pairs fields it is you know definitely a difficult task for a lot of federations who are like more focused on singles and like you're funneling them into singles all the ones who can basically jump go into singles and even if you have like a couple of skaters that maybe can't jump as well as the others or might not be suited to going into training for you know international level events you still don't necessarily want to siphon it off into pairs because that's a whole nother set of like infrastructure that needs to be built you you know you need coaches you you might need to send them abroad for training you need to you know fund a whole bunch of programs for them it's a lot it's a lot to commit and I can see why a lot of feds don't do it but at the same time it's like you guys could really if you built up a, a pairs team you could send them to worlds you could send them to four continents or euros you know if you built up at least one you could even qualify for the, for the olympics and we've seen that with smaller feds you know getting pairs teams and qualifying for events yeah well just going briefly into the infrastructure that you mentioned like i know in russia the figure skating kind of community and teams and you know all the competitors are very nationalized from a young age so you do have people actively like you know watching these young skaters who usually start out in singles and then kind of you know, putting them in like pairs or dance when it seems like they're maybe struggling with their jumps or they're, you know, not as gifted jumpers. And that's how you start developing these like pairs teams from a really young age. Whereas in the US or in, you know, other countries that aren't like Russia and China, 
you probably don't see that as much where it's more kind of based on, you know, how the skater feels about, you know, their, their performance and competing as singles versus as a team. And it's just, there's a lot more kind of like top down infrastructure in Russia and China, I think, to where you can start like really strategically pairing up these skaters who might have started out in singles and then, you know, transforming them into Paris champions. But yeah, definitely looking into the final, it's not surprising that Penfilova and Rilova are pretty much the clear favorites to win here. Personally, I, I can't see them not coming out with the goal just based on their record of consistency just not throughout this junior grand prix season but for, through all through last year as well you know unless they have a serious mistake even then i mean honestly when did pairs become like the least stressful discipline with regards to predictions <laughs> <laughs> like this is like a walk in the park compared to any of the other disciplines rust fed is clearly putting their eggs in the pamphilova relove basket but i think it definitely comes with the caveat that pamphilova and relove are going to need their side-by-side triples once they turn senior, which I would expect to be probably next season. Like, I don't know how much more they can do in juniors after, you know, winning both of their events and they're probably going to win the final. And it seems like the logical next step for them to be seniors next season. Especially considering like next season is going to be Olympic qualification season. Uh, don't say that. Okay, listen, <laughs> <laughs> they're probably going to be looking to try and make a case for themselves to get on that Beijing Olympic team, even though they're a fresher pair. You know, if they manage to get consistent side-by-side triples by, like, next season, I could easily see them potentially vying for one of those pair spots. Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. Yeah, I think it's definitely too soon to say. But there's at least probably four to five Paris teams who I would give the advantage to over them at this point. I know it's, like, very early to be making any kind of predictions about the Olympic team. (laughs) Based on what we've seen so far. But that said, this is definitely the season for Pamphilova and Rilov to start racking up some wins on the junior circuit and to roll out new tech if they're, you know, so inclined to do so because the absence of Mishina and Galiamov in juniors has really thinned out the Russian junior field pretty considerably. And I think that Pamphilova and Rilov no longer have, like, you know, rivals kind of breathing down their necks and chasing them. And they should feel more comfortable taking risks this season knowing they're the clear front runners and hopefully getting comfortable with you know, upping their tech and making a strong case for themselves to be a top senior team as well. Yeah, especially if uh, Kostyokovic and Elon make their comeback like at Russian Junior Nationals or get, if they get a spot on the Junior Worlds team. If Panflover and Rilov have that kind of track record of meddling and getting these really good scores, that means that even if Kostyokovic and Elon do decently well, they could still argue to be placed at the same level or above them, which, you know, would do wonders for them personally the problem is that everyone else who is qualified is either a pretty young team or they're just wildly inconsistent like especially with like think skaters like Akinteva and Kolosov and Pepeleva and Pleshkov like they have the goods but they're just so you know unpredictable and whether or not they're going to skate close to clean on any given day and that you know really hurts not just you know their meddling chances but it hurts their scores overall in the season because they don't have those track records of you know skating close to clean multiple times yeah I do think that the possibility for Russian sweep of the podium there's a pretty high chance of it happening like last season I fully expect or I don't fully expect but I think that the podium will probably be the same order as the qualifiers, barring, you know, any major mistakes from the top three going in. Yeah, I think maybe that Annika and Robert could potentially make an argument for the podium here at the final if they skated clean, because, you know, they, as we've said before, they skate like they're seniors. They don't seem like juniors. Their performance, their interpretation, and just their overall basic skating skills are really, really strong, like enough to get those higher PCS marks. And so I think that if they were clean, they could definitely, you know, make an argument for them to be on the podium, you know, bronze or silver maybe. Yeah, there's definitely an opening there for them. And that would be interesting to have a non-completely Russian Junior Grand Prix final podium. Should we talk about the men? I guess. So for the men and the podiums in Croatia, we had Andrei Mozilev of Russia in first, Artur Danilian of Russia in second, and Shun Sato of Japan in third. In Enya, we had Daniel Grassel of Italy in first, Peter Gumenik of Russia in second, and Ivan Shmaratko of Ukraine 
in third. Yeah, so as we kind of predicted, Croatia was a little bit hellish. <laughs> but it's it wasn't entirely the, on the skaters. It wasn't, you know, because the field was so wild. It was like, possibly the ice was bad. Yeah, I noticed that like during the free skate, a lot of the times when people were landing, there was a significant like amount of ice spray, like more than you would see normally. And you could see like at the sides of the, at the edges of the rink, you could see the ice start to like slush up and build up. And, you know, I was really, really worried about that because everyone was kind of dying <laughs> in the free here. And I was like, oh God, is it, is there an ice issue? And it didn't like, I didn't notice any other problems in the other disciplines. Like, so it might've just been that particular day and that kind of time that it, they were having issues but I was just like oh god this is making this already stressful competition like a billion times more stressful come on guys this is ice problems is a thing for like the senior grand prix <laughs> the juniors are supposed to do a better job it's a thing for IDF yeah exactly <laughs> but yeah just Croatia the field was just so stacked and it was definitely an up and down sort of competition we had a lot of like changes from the short to the free which was kind of to be expected considering how many like top men were skating here and it was just all over a bit crazy and then also like at Enya we also had some surprising moments because uh Daniel ended up winning which I personally was not really expecting (laughs) and the fact that they gave both Peter and Daniel exactly the same PCS in the free like like exactly the same like they both got 74.36 PCS (laughs) and I was just sitting there looking at the results page going what the hell happened? Yeah, personally, I would definitely give the edge to Daniel just as a function of him like being older and kind of more mature. But you never know, I guess. Listen, how could you not give Peter extreme crazy PCS when he gave you that performance, that ending pose, the face on his ending pose, of his phantom program? How could you not give that tens for performance, the crazy face? <laughs> Drama king. But yeah, let's actually, let's go into talking about Daniel a little bit more. So yeah, he was first here at Enya and he actually podiumed back a couple of weeks ago in Gdansk. He got the bronze medal and uh, with both of those medals, he actually edged out uh, Arta Danilian for a place at the final, which I certainly was not expecting to happen. I saw him like go into the lead and I was like, wait a second and, th- and then I pulled up like the qualifying list and I was like wait a second they'll have the same meta points but Daniel will win the tiebreaker because he'll, he'll get a first place here so that means he's going to the final what the hell after the short I was anticipating I was like if he has like a solid a solid free with his crazy you know technical content I wouldn't be surprised if they gave him the win I mean, he is, so Daniel is 17. He's not a lot older, but he is older than a lot of the other juniors. And it definitely shows in his skating skills and his his expressiveness and his ice coverage. He has total body awareness when he's out there skating. So all of his movements kind of look complete, which you don't necessarily see with um, some of the younger men who are just kind of getting out there. And he is super flexible. He has really creative spin positions, like I think you sent me that that screen cap of him in like the donut spin. The donut, yeah. <laughs> he has this, yeah. He has this like hyper extended donut spin where basically his like leg, his foot is right like bent so far that it basically touches his thigh, and it's the craziest optical illusion. I mean, good for him. Daniel is so leggy. We definitely need more like creative spins in men's. I think aside from like the three or four positions that like all the men tend to you know divert to. I support it. That said, the free skate costume, dude, like, just the the blood spatter, <laughs> why? Yeah, it looks like someone shot him several times with, like, a rhinestone gun. <laughs> That's what it looks like. <laughs> it reminds me of um, Alexei Bachenko's, like, vampire costume. Dracula? From, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with, like, the blood, like, the fake dried blood. I'm like, I really, I, I respect the commitment to, like, the aesthetic, but maybe <laughs> it's maybe a little too much. And also, like, talking about his insane tech in the free skate, he opens with the quad lutz and then goes to the quad loop. He didn't quite get the quad loop landed here. I don't really understand why he's, like, necessarily going for the quad loop when he doesn't need it to be competitive. Like, none of the junior men are really doing, like, that many quads in the free skate yet. Like, there are some men with quad lutzes. No one's doing a quad flip as far as I know. It's mostly, like, quad toes is what you're seeing from, you know, men on this level. I mean, I respect him for, you know, wanting to kind of push the boundaries of junior men skating, but 
it's scary just pushing the boundaries of not just junior men skating but i think european men in general especially considering daniel also competes on the senior level like he did last season he went to euros as well and he'll probably end up doing that again that's why i was really surprised when i saw him on the junior grand prix list this season because i was like daniel you competed like on the juniors and senior circuit last season why aren't you just you know gonna go up to seniors oh no you're not okay you're staying on here for a bit that's cool i think it's like a smart decision on his end to not necessarily make that jump into seniors quite yet because i don't think he would you know be winning senior grand prix or you know higher level senior events at the level he's at now but he can easily win a junior event like we see here and that's really important for a skater from a small fed to build that international reputation and get some wins under his belt and to make a better case for getting like high scores when he does finally decide to make that leap and also he's eligible for two more years so you know why not yeah and like he did pretty reasonably well on the junior grand prix last season i he didn't qualify because I believe he had back-to-back junior Grand Prix last season. He was at Bratislava and then he was at Austria the following week. And, you know, back-to-back events is never a fun time. And so he was a little bit uh, of a mess uh, at one of them and unfortunately just missed out on qualifying for the final. But then, of course, you know, he medaled at Junior Worlds last season. So things ended up pretty well for him. And now he's going to be going to the final and then he gets to skate again in front of another home crowd, which is going to be nice. Yeah, I'm really glad he got to have that win, you know, in his home rink. Like this is literally the rink he trains in. And Ted was talking about how, you know, his family and friends were on the stands. They were cheering him on. It was so like pure and wholesome. And this is also the first Junior Grand Prix we've had that didn't have either a Japanese or a Russian men's champion. So yeah, he, he did break that streak for sure. Good for him. I support him. He is a chaos child and I support him. Let's go on to talk about another bit of a chaos child, I guess. Uh, Adam Siaohimfar of France. He was eighth in Croatia and fifth in Anya. Uh, he actually withdrew from Courchevel in week one, uh, apparently due to injury and recovery not going so great. And so he got reassigned and unfortunately got reassigned to back-to-back due to Grand Prix. And he was a little bit of a mess at both of them, unfortunately. And it, it really made me sad to see because I really, really like Adam. Even though he had kind of a rocky skate at Croatia, he did have a really good free skate at Enya. He skated pretty much near clean, and I was very, very happy for him. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was sad to see him struggle so much this season, because he did make the final last year, but hopefully, you know, better things for him soon. I think not going to the final is probably a good thing at this point, because it seems like he really needs some time to just recover and, like, you know, regain his footing, and hopefully we'll see him, you know, at French Nationals and then junior worlds if all pans out for him maybe even europeans because he went to euros last season too yeah i think his programs this season are looking pretty good from what i saw i'm not completely sold in his short program as of this moment but i think just because adam you know sometimes he can get a little bit caught up in his elements and not completely express the meaning of the program or the choreography and you know that happens sometimes shall we move on to ivan shmaratko of Ukraine. He was third in Enya, also quite a surprise coming from a small federation. I feel about about him the same way I feel about Daniel Grassel with regards to being on the older side for juniors and definitely showing in his performance and how he fills the rink. His footwork is super fast and it gives him the impression of almost floating across the ice which is really nice. It's like hard to explain. You just have to watch him. He's, yeah, he's very aesthetically pleasing to watch and you you can just like you said you can just tell that he is older and you know he's had more experience competing in Ashley because he just fills the rink with all of his movements seem so big and meaningful and that really you know adds to his overall performance and it really sells his programs I also just kind of like the little uh, shuffle movements he does at the start of the free skate uh, they made me smile a little bit because he's just like shuffle 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 <laughs> it's very, very cute yeah the pantomiming is definitely interesting <laughs> it's strong it's <laughs> miming is strong with this one yeah his jumps are you know they're fairly solid um he does have a bit of a flutz but generally he doesn't cause me as much like you know heart stress as some of the other junior men with regards to his tech which is nice i appreciate that my heart appreciates that well he doesn't have any quads so <laughs> well you know what maybe we should novel idea maybe we should focus on maybe everyone getting their triples down pat before they start trying quads what just no, Kai. That's just that's <laughs> silly talk. What are you? 
<laughs> Getting a triple stun first. What are you talking about? It's me and my soapbox. <laughs> you sure it's up to ISU Congress next year? <laughs> <laughs> he does have, you know, pretty interesting spin positions. Like, I don't think I've seen many men attempt illusion spins. You know, it's mostly done in ladies' singles. Not always very well. It's not really my favorite spin position just because of, like, the flexibility you need to have to do it. But I appreciate him, like, going for it and kind of trying to break that mold. This is his third junior season, which is, I think, a smart move. Like I was saying with Daniel, considering that Yvonne is a small fed skater and can only benefit from getting an international reputation on the junior stage. But that said, I do hope to see him make that full transition to senior soon because his components are senior quality. Like he does not skate like a junior and he just stands out like a sore thumb and like a field of, you know, 13 and 14 year old men when he's like has these, you know, gorgeous deep running edges and like total body awareness. So definitely great to see him do so well here. Yeah, I really hope that he has like a good like second half of the season. I am really looking forward to see him at Junior Worlds. I hope he really makes a case for himself, you know, if he chooses to move up to senior next season. I hope he makes a case for himself to, you know, hopefully get some bigger international assignments because his skating is just so nice to watch. Let's go on to talk about uh, the Junior Grand Prix final for the men. So our qualifiers uh, in order are Andrei Mozilev of Russia, Yuma Kagiyama of Japan, uh, Peter Gumenik of Russia, Daniel Grassel of Italy, Daniil Samsonov of Russia, and Shun Sato of Japan. Yeah, we've got a bit of an interesting uh, mix of countries at this event. And, you know, we have three Russian men, which is a bit shocking considering last season we had one Russian man qualify. And now we have three. And we also have two Japanese men and an Italian man. It's definitely a demographic shift. Well, let's talk about first who isn't going to be at the final. So Steven Gogolev of Canada is not going to be at the final, unfortunately. I'm a little bit concerned for him because the junior men's field is definitely closing ranks about around the top spots. And his next major international competition is probably going to be Junior Worlds. And he's not likely to get a lot of, you know, international exposure before then. I, I'm also concerned because he did make a coaching change this season, or over the offseason, rather. So he changed from Lee Barkel um, at the Toronto Cricket Club to um, Rafael Artunian in, in California. And he's also hitting some growth spurts, like, around this time. And this year's junior men's field just happens to be pretty strong. So it probably wasn't the best time for him to have made, like, a major coaching change. But Lee Barkel leaving you know, Toronto Cricket Club kind of left Steven in a bad spot. Whereas, you know, he could have moved with Lee, but I guess, you know, he decided it wasn't the best idea. I mean, Lee is still coaching him, but it's not, Raf's now his main coach. Yeah, he's no longer, like, he's completely relocated his training base, which can be really jarring. And, you know, he obviously now works with Raf a lot more than he works with Lee because he's in California and Raf's in California. Yeah, I think that probably, I kind of disagree on the coaching change point, just because I think this is probably out of all the times to do it, probably the best time, considering this is Steven's last season of just being junior eligible, because next season he'll be senior eligible, and probably he'll be looking to move up fairly quickly, considering, you know, Olympic qualifications in Canada will want to, you know, vie for a couple of men's spots, and he's, you know, in a position where if he makes substantial improvements over this season, you know, we've seen him retooling his jumping technique. You know, his lots has gotten quite a bit better over these last couple of competitions that we've seen. And if he makes those technical strides and also, you know, hopefully improves his, you know, component skills a bit to back up those technical improvements, he could definitely, you know, contend for an Olympic spot for Canada potentially make it to Beijing you know if, if I were to pick a time for him to ch change coaches it would probably be now just because it's kind of this is kind of a transition year for him I mean realistically like at you know just looking at how things stack up right now I don't think he's gonna have much of an issue getting an Olympic spot you know depending on like how many Canada has but you know if they get at least two spots I would definitely put money on him to have one of those spots if you know his growth continues from here and his jumps you know can stay intact and he can work on his performance a little bit it is better that you know if he had to change coaches it's better that he did it like now and not like the pre-olympic year but it is a testament to how like crazy the junior men's field has gotten is that like last year's junior grand prix final champion who was steven who was actually the first alternate last year and then subbed in when andrew Torgashev pulled out didn't qualify for the final and it's yeah, there's there's a lot of movement in the field right now, and it's we're just trying to keep up with it, man. 
<laughs> there's just so much stuff going on. We have so many, like, not only just new junior men that have kind of shown up out of nowhere and gone, hey, I can contend for medals now. But then we also have the, like, older juniors that have been around for a season or two that have really started to, you know, grow into their skating and have been like, oh, yeah, look, I've gotten consistent. Or like, hey, I've got a quad now. And look, I can get on the top of the podium kind of thing. It's just, it's really interesting to see the way the junior men's field has kind of shifted just over like a season because the field was completely different last season in terms of like not only consistency but like quality but just who's actually vying for medals it's really kind of crazy to see the differences that we've like seen just over such a short period of time yeah so speaking of kind of men being on the younger side in the final this season um i was just looking at like the qualifying documents and just laughing to myself because the discrepancy between like the combined totals like the combined total raw scores of the skaters and like the qualifying points really shows like how chaotic this year was because like Yuma Kagiyama and Daniel Samsonov both had higher combined like total scores than Andre Moselev but fewer qualifying points so they qualified second and fifth respectively but Yuma actually had he would be the number one qualifier if it went by you know, raw points. Yeah, it's just kind of insane. The weirdness of this Junior Grand Prix series and the way events were kind of stacked up made it so that the like the margins by which men were winning in each competitions, they were wildly different. And that's not particularly unusual in junior men, but in here it's just like, yeah, look, as you said, looking at the qualifier list and looking at all of the combined scores and going, okay. Okay, things happened. (laughs) The final is definitely going to be interesting to see how it shapes up because right now I honestly couldn't tell you like who would make the podium because the it's just gonna it's so up in the air. The anyone could potentially make the podium here. It's crazy. Yeah, I think anyone potentially could win. The title is definitely up for grabs, which is more than you can say for like any of the other disciplines. (laughs) Men continues to be chaotic. Yep. It's Yeah, it's going to just come down to the fact of who skates the best in that particular day. And it's really exciting just from a viewing standpoint, the fact that we have so much, you know, mystery going into the final of who we don't necessarily know who's going to make the podium. It's going to make the competition even more exciting and even more stressful to watch in December, I guess. Yeah, the flip side of, you know, not everyone having the potential to be on the podium is that none of these men are the most consistent skaters. Yep. (laughs) And so get ready for chaos, guys. Get ready for chaos. The theme of the Junior Grand Prix. So let's go on to talking about ice dance uh, for our podiums in Croatia. In first, we have Maria Kazakova and Georgi Revia of Georgia. In second, we have Sofia Tutininia and Alexander Shatitsky of Russia. And in third, we have Emi Bronsard and Aisa Boagia of Canada. And on our podium for Enya, in first, we have Elizaveta Kudabadieva and Andrei Filatov of Russia. In second, we have Natalie Del Alessandro and Bruce Waddell of Canada. And in third, we have Angelina Lazareva and Maxim Prokofiev of Russia. Yeah, so surprising podium in Anya a little bit because Elisaveta and Andre originally said that they were going to withdraw from their second assignment due to illness. And then it was like the day before the rhythm dance and their names were still on the roster. And then I think Elisaveta posted something about it on Instagram about like, you know, competing in the rhythm dance on her birthday. And we're like, oh, okay. Yes, they're going to be there. They're going to be here. Yay! It was really, you know, comforting to see because, you know, we all love Lisa and Andre. And yet it was kind of a given that they were going to win the event. If they were, it was just like, you're competing, you're probably going to win. Not too upset about (laughs) that. And then we also had two Canadian teams breaking the trend of Canadian ice dancers getting the potato medal on the Junior Grand Prix. So bronze medal in Croatia, silver medal in Enya for the Canadians. Although another Canadian team did get the potato medal at Croatia. <laughs> so <laughs> can't have everything. A little bit of a curse broken. You can't have everything. You can have some things. But yeah, I think that especially in Enya, like as soon as Elisabetta and Andre said that they were going to be competing, I was like, okay, you know, the podium is a little bit more clear cut now because before that I was kind of looking at the entry list going like, hmm, well, there isn't really like that many standout, definitely going to podium teams here. And the same kind of with Croatia because I was like, okay, Maria and Georgi are probably going to get the gold, but the other two podium spots are kind of, you know, we've got some skaters that could potentially 
make it and some you know there are a couple that could vie for those spots and so just seeing how everyone skated it was quite interesting to see the final podium makeup and also just in general how some teams did in both of the segments in comparison to one another like we had the brown siblings uh, una brown and gage brown of the u.s they came in uh seventh at chelyabinsk uh just a couple weeks ago and they actually came in second here at the free at Enya, which was a little bit of a surprise for me. I was watching it and I was just like, holy crap, they've got a 91. They're probably going to, you know, place pretty highly here in the free dance. And they ended up coming in second. I was just like, oh boy, this is great. Yeah, they have so much like positive, powerful energy. I love it, especially Uno's energy. She just exudes like charm. And like musicality, it's a bit of a shame about the twizzles in the rhythm dance because she did slip off her edge a little bit, probably cost them a couple points, two or three points at least. They're actually using the same rhythm dance music as Katarina Volkostin and Jeffrey Chen. I said it'll be interesting when they finally go against each other. Evie reminded me that they did go against each other in Russia, (laughs) but I was mostly referring to like U.S. nationals or junior nationals rather, like how they kind of stack up, you know, domestically, like when it comes to getting spots for Junior Worlds and such, how that's going to shake out. Yeah, I think, yeah, especially with their scoring, I think on a national level, it's going to be interesting to see how they, you know, stack up against each other. But we've already seen at Chelyabinsk that Wolf Kostin and Chen uh, did place above the Brown siblings, both in the overall and in both uh, segments. And although I would probably, you know, I would put their skill overall, like skating skill and element level, pretty much on kind of the same kind of playing field with maybe just like a little bit of an edge to the brown siblings because I with for their lifts because I love their lifts their lifts are so nice especially the like curve lift that they do where Una does like the back bend when she's standing on like Gage's legs it's great 10 out of 10 I love creative lifts but yeah uh, I think that's probably might be the scoring discrepancy between two I think I might be partially due to the fact that the brown siblings don't really have uh, they're not under a high-profile coach, whereas Wolf Costin and Shannon are both. Uh, they're under Igor, who is a high, a bit of a high-profile coach. He's got, the, you know, that reputation that comes from being with a bigger, you know, ice dance camp kind of thing. So the Browns are kind of at a disadvantage on that front. But yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how the two teams kind of, you know, stack up against each other at Junior Nationals. Junior. Ice dance is higher stress than junior pairs does. So another uh, U.S. team that was uh, actually at both of the events, uh, Croatia and Enya, uh, Katarina Delkamp and Ian Somerville. They're a new team and they placed 10th in Croatia and 4th at Enya. Ian used to be partnered with Eliana Gropman last season and they were actually the U.S. junior national bronze medalists. They also, you know, they went to the uh, junior world championships and then they broke up early in the off season, I believe in around uh, May is when we got the news uh and according to eliana on an instagram post she was told that their partnership was over via an email that she got after she returned from her senior trip in europe and because apparently while she was away on that trip ian had already started skating with a new partner who was presumably you know his current partner katarina but just like oh geez drama (laughs) oh boy but just looking at ian i think he's really you know grown into quite a solid ice dance man his postures improved the awareness of like his legs and overall his lower body has really really improved since the last time i saw him skate at junior worlds and like his lines are really really nice katarina i mean i just she's got good expression she's she seems nice i don't think right now and this might just be the fact that they're a brand new team they don't really seem like a team right at this second they kind of seem a little bit mismatched technically speaking yeah I think Katarina I definitely pay more attention to Katarina than to Ian when they're skating she kind of has this like Lisa K like charm and charisma that kind of draws you in like she even has a physical resemblance to Lisa K but yeah like Evie said her skating skills really aren't quite there yet like she's very leggy but she doesn't seem to know how to really use that to her advantage yet so the result is that her knees are pretty stiff she doesn't really bend into them she doesn't hold her free leg extension at all and the result is that it kind of looks like she's kicking during the pattern it's really unfortunate because she's so beautiful and she like is clearly capable of creating these gorgeous lines and you know painting this beautiful picture on the ice with how long her limbs are but she kind of needs to grow into them a little bit more yeah i think that obviously this is 
their first season as a team. It's their kind of, you know, season where they're looking to, you know, get a little bit of experience on an international field, you know, see how they skate together and train together as a partnership. And, you know, maybe once they've got a bit more experience, once they've, you know, been together for a couple more months, they'll kind of grow into that partnership and get that kind of more synchronicity with each other. And then hopefully, you know, as their skills improve, they will start, you know, skating more as a unit rather than two individual skaters. We hope, because I really see they both have a lot of potential. Okay, going into the Junior Grand Prix final, here are our qualifiers in qualifying order. Uh, first is Avonlea Wen and Vadim Kolesnik of the U.S. And second, Elizaveta Shaneva and David Narizhny of Russia. And third, Elizaveta Kudaburdieva and Andrei Filatov of Russia. And fourth, Maria Kazakova and Gorgi Rivia of Georgia. In fifth, Loisia de Mojo and Theo Le Mercier of France. And in sixth, Diana Davis and Gleb Smolkin of Russia. So, Wen and Kolesnik are going into the Junior Grand Prix final as top qualifiers. They earn two of the three highest total scores on the Junior Grand Prix this season, which is quite a shakeup from last season. Yeah, definitely a shakeup, but not one that I am particularly upset about seeing. <laughs> I'm very happy and excited for them being the top qualifiers here. And I think they have a really, really good shot uh, at meddling at the Junior Grand Prix final, possibly even winning, you know, knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if they skate as well as, they, as, as well as they've been skating in their qualifiers, they should have no trouble getting on that podium. I just really hope that they don't become complacent with the fact that they've been doing well and getting those high scores because this field is really, really deep here. And if they miss a level or two, which, you know, isn't out of the ordinary for them, we've seen it happen at, pa at past events, it could really shake it them up, just not like scores wise, but also confidence wise. And so, you know, I'm just praying that they have a good showing at the final, <laughs> basically. Yeah. They didn't really face any major challengers at their assignments, but that obviously changes going into the final. And so, yeah, they're going to need to hit every single element in order to make a case for winning. I just hope that they have a better final experience uh, than last season when they had all of the, the visa trouble with Vadim not getting a visa in time. They had to miss out on that practice. I just hope that they have no issues going to, uh, to Reno <laughs> in December. Making it to Italy this year. Come on, please, guys. But yeah, I think that especially there are a couple of teams that are definitely going to challenge them for those for that top spot. I think especially with Shaneva and Rizhny, uh, out of all of the teams here, I see them being the biggest threat just because of their consistency over the season and the scores they've been getting. And also their skating skills are really, really good. And they have overall a really good chance at hitting their levels most of the time or getting close to it. And so, yeah, definitely, I see them as probably the biggest threat to Avonlea and Vanim going to the final. Yeah, I would say that it's going to be Shaneva and Narizhny versus probably Kudabrdi and Filatov for silver. I would definitely give Shaneva and Narizhny the edge, just based on how consistent they've been, the fact that they've been skating together longer. Whereas Kudabrdi and Filatov are a very new team. They haven't been receiving the scores that um, Elizaveta received with her previous partner last season, but they've shown that they can still win comfortably. So it's going to be an interesting toss-up. Um, I would probably have them more kind of in bronze territory along with um, Kostakova and Rivia. But yeah, the Georgians could definitely get kicked off the podium if all um, both of the Russian teams are clean. Yeah, they definitely have, you know, I think... Kazakova and Revia, yeah, they definitely have a shot, but it's going to just be up to how everyone else in the field skates that particular day. With uh, Demajou and Le Mercier and Davis and Smolkin, I really don't see them making the podium unless someone in the top four makes a significant mistake. There's definitely always that, you know, potential for them to get on that podium, but at the moment, just looking at overall scores... I don't really see them making it. It'd be a nice surprise if they did. But, you know. Yeah, Ice Dance tends to be kind of be more consistent than the other disciplines. It's easier to make predictions, but, you know, surprises can still happen. Yeah, definitely. Surprises definitely can still happen. I mean, stationary lift base happens. That's true. This is true. <laughs> Anything can happen. But things happen less in Ice Dance, I think. <laughs> Literally. Okay, should we go on to the ladies? Let's do it. So in Croatia, our ladies medalists. In first, Heian Lee of Korea. In second, Daria Usacheva of Russia. And in third, Anna Frolova of Russia. 
In Enya, we had Senya Sinitsna of Russia in first, Anna Frilova of Russia in second, and Alessia Tornaghi of Italy in third. So we have Hayan Lee, our Junior Grand Prix final qualifier, Woo! with 30 home points after winning uh, Croatia, which is just the nicest surprise this season has given me, basically, in <laughs> ladies so far. I love the fact that she's been able to win both of her events and manage to qualify with four points going to the final. I'm just, I'm really, really happy for her. Korean ladies rise. Yeah. We had, before Enya, we had you know, glimmer of a hope of maybe two Korean ladies making it to the final. Unfortunately, Young Jung Park had kind of a rough short program in Inya that took her out of, you know, really qualifying for final contention because she was 12th after the short program and she really needed to get a silver medal or better here. Yeah, her combo at the start of the short, she had a really good like triple lutz. It had really great height and distance, but then it just had a little bit too much distance and you could just see that she was going to run out of room to stick the triple toe in and she did it anyway and ended up falling right into the boards and it was really awful to see. And then she also had problems with the loop and I was just, oh, I felt so bad for her. But she managed to, you know, bounce back and she placed third in the free here. So yeah, just, ugh, we could have had it all. We could have had two Korean ladies at the final. Unfortunately, that just wasn't in the stars for us, I guess. Yeah. And speaking of other ladies who won't be in the final, all the Japanese ladies who were supposed to compete in Inya withdrew. Rino Matsueke, who is the bronze medalist in Riga, was Japan's only medalist in ladies this year. She had a shot of qualifying for the Junior Grand Prix final. It was a pretty slim chance. She would have had to probably win in Enya, but then she ended up withdrawing about a week before the event, which is really unfortunate that Japanese junior ladies are kind of a little bit in this valley right now. And the Japanese senior ladies are obviously so strong already that I would like to see the JSF maybe just invest a little bit more in juniors and kind of bring them up to that level and you know make them real contenders for when they do decide to switch to the senior level yeah we've just got so much new talent at the moment like for a lot of first year junior ladies at the moment or at least the ones that we saw uh here at, on the junior grand prix this season so it's just a matter of like maybe in a uh, maybe in like a season or two they'll you know mature and grow up to be like really well-rounded skaters because we've seen a couple of them that definitely have that like it factor that you know they could potentially grow into really amazing skaters but it's just going to take time and speaking of that let's just go on to talk about Monica Abe who came in fourth uh, at Croatia, who had a surprise triple axel attempt in the free. And she fell on it, but, you know, it was just a, a what? That was that was a triple axel. Okay, I'm I am awake now. Yeah, so she trains with um, Mia Hamada, who also trains Rika Kihara, so I'm not super surprised that she went for it. <laughs> I don't know what goes on in that rank, but it just seems very chaotic. Chaos, yeah, chaos happens at that rank. <laughs> she was pretty short on the rotation, but good on her for, you know, going for it. She she is super fast. She's tiny, but she is so fast. She completely flies during the step sequence, which kind of poses a bit of a problem for her because she only got level two on the steps in both programs. So it seems like she's so fast that she's actually hopping some steps and not, you know, ticking all the boxes to get her levels. And also she does tend to lose control of her jumps when she enters because she enters so fast and she is super powerful, obviously, but she needs to learn how to rein in that power and to really, you know, dish it out in small and smaller quantities. I really love the way that she uses her arms and her upper body. Like, th all of her movements flow so nicely and they make it all seem like a complete package. It's just really, I couldn't stop looking at, especially in the f her free skate, the way that she uses her arms in just in her transitional movements and stuff to accent like the highlights of the music or, you know, sell the character of the Black Swan. It just really made it a program for me. I just, I see a lot of potential in her. She's got a really good basic foundation and I'm just excited to see where she'll go from here. She is a chaos child, but I love her. Yeah, can we just briefly mention that she did a triple flip, triple toe in the last 30 seconds of her free oh, skate like God. girl what the hell <laughs> i'm like please my heart i'm so old my heart can't take it <laughs> i can't take this kind of abuse please mana <laughs> think of yeah us she's when you're doing this. she's obviously super intense she's unpolished clearly she needs you know to control her movements a little bit more but a ton of potential and i'm really excited to see her going into probably senior nationals i wouldn't be surprised if she competed at senior nationals 
screw Japan. Let's talk about uh, Ksenia Sinitsina, who was our gold medalist here. And, and yeah, she was our silver medalist in Chelly events just a couple of weeks ago. But uh, kind of unsurprisingly, she took the gold medal here in Italy. Uh, and she actually scored the highest short program score of the junior ladies this season with uh, 74.65. Uh, the record was previously held by Camilla uh, and Ksenia got a whole like point above that, which is very interesting. <laughs> but I think her like overall, her elements are really, really nice. Like she's got really nice technique, which you kind of expect from uh, skaters in Panova's camp. They have in general, really nice jump technique and spins as well. I think her spins are really, really good. She's got great flexibility and can hit those really nice, aesthetically pleasing positions. And so, you know, the fact that her all of her elements are so nice, you know, she can get those really high grades of execution. Like, she didn't get a single mark below a plus two in anything in her short, which is really, really great for a junior skater. It really just speaks to her overall level of polish. I think, in general, her performance still needs a little bit of work but you know this is only her second junior season we don't expect senior level performances but yeah especially her short which is quite a heavy piece of music I don't think it really suits her currently her free skate I don't even really want to go into it because I'm pretty sure it's going to be talked about on the cultural appropriation episode that we're going to do in a couple weeks because yeah it's a it's a thing. This season is definitely a whole thing when it comes to programs that maybe shouldn't have happened. <laughs> maybe. So going on to the Junior Grand Prix final, our qualifiers for this year are Camila Valieva of Russia, Alyssa Liu of the US, Hain Lee of Korea, Ksenia Sinitsina of Russia, Daria Usacheva of Russia, and Victoria Vasilieva of Russia. So four Russian ladies in the Junior Grand Prix final, and there is zero overlap from last year. <laughs> which really speaks to the depth of the Russian junior field, even after um, last year's top three, which are, you know, Sherbakova, Trusova, and Kostrnaya moved up to seniors. And Aliona Konosheva sat out the Junior Grand Prix, and Anastasia Tarakanova just missed the final. It's just insane the amount of shakeups that we could have. Like, I kind of expected this considering the, you know, all of the people moving up to seniors this season, but just seeing how crazy the field has been i'm just i'm extremely excited for the final but i'm also incredibly scared <laughs> oh i am not thinking about it really until <laughs> then <laughs> yeah so looking into some matchups the combined totals kind of speak for themselves i think like camilla has a combined total of 422.66 and Alyssa has 411.20 yes um Alyssa actually has quite a bit of an edge on base value. So combined base value for both programs is 109 for Alyssa currently and 103.12 for Camilla. But Camilla can definitely make up that difference because she gets the superior GOE and PCS, rightfully so, I think. If both are clean. This is all if both are clean. <laughs> if both are clean. Yes. Is, wait, is, the, is Alyssa's uh, technical content... Uh, that 109 includes if she does the triple axel in the short or no? Yeah, this is with the triple axel, triple toe in the short. Okay. So this is, that's what she did in Poland. Yeah, so that's, you mean, that is the heart attack number. Yeah. The 109 is the heart attack number. Yes, absolutely, the heart attack number. <laughs> uh, Camilla, um, based on what she scored in Russia with a fall, she's going to push about 230 total with two Jesus clean programs. Christ. If she does the two quads in the free skate, which that is not going to be matched by anybody else. I'm going to just stake, you know, plant my flag on this <laughs> hill right now and say if she has two clean programs, she is probably going to be the runaway winner. Realistically, I think she can probably win even with one quad if, if everything else is clean. And I think Alyssa is very much the favorite for the silver right now if she's clean. But with mistakes, she can definitely be challenged by like Senia because her score at JGP Anya was higher than both of Alyssa's on the Junior Grand Prix. Yeah, it just depends. It it depends on what Alyssa's layout's going to look like and just comes down to the day of how well she skates because there's definitely a chance that she could, you know, get on top of the podium here. And there's, But there's also, you know, look, just looking at the fact that she hasn't skated uh, two clean programs and the fact that she might be doing that triple axel combo in the short, it's just a lot of question marks as to how her consistency is going to be 
at the final and I hope that she you know takes this month break to really you know finalize her strategy get her head in the game and you know hopefully come to the final ready to you know put down two great performances I mean she was pretty close to queen in Poland I think she had the mistake in the short but the free was pretty solid and she got I think 208 whereas Camilla had you know a pretty nasty fall when she was competing in Russia in the free skate and she got 221. I think it's it's clear at this point who the judges are going to give it to if they're both, you know, reasonably solid. Obviously, neither of them have actually been clean in both programs yet. So it'll be interesting to see how it shakes out if they both have mistakes, which I don't think is out of the realm of possibility at this point. It's never out of the realm of possibility. <laughs> <laughs> but that said... The race, I think, at this point is mostly for the bronze medal, and all the other ladies have a realistic shot at it, I think. So Haiyan and Senya have both scored over 200 at their assignments, but I think third through sixth is probably going to come down to the wire, because all of the ladies scored in the 190s and above at both of their assignments, which is crazy. Oh boy, junior ladies is going to give me a heart attack, honestly. It already has, but it's going to give me even more of a heart attack. Considering taking, like, heart medication at this point, it's it's bad. Just thematically looking at, you know, kind of the bigger picture in ladies, I would say it's closer for the silver and the bronze this year compared to last year, but the front runner probably has more distance from the rest of the pack. Like, last year um, at the final, there were three ladies who could realistically have won the whole thing, and it really speaks to how dominant historic, you know, the three A's were during their short time as juniors and how their departure has really shaken up the field and made it so that it feels like anything could happen. Whereas, you know, in the last two seasons, it was basically a sure bet that, you know, one of the Atari girls showed up that they were probably going to win. And now it's just kind of a like, well, you know, 20 different things could happen on the day of the competition and who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> and the fact that we own, you know, this is the first time in like quite a while where we have had, you know, we've got two non-Russian ladies qualifying for the final, which is really, really exciting overall. And it's just looking towards the final. I mean, ladies at the Junior Grand Prix final is always hell. <laughs> it's always a lot, but it's going to be such an exciting competition to watch because, you know, not only are we going to have probably some crazy technical elements, but we, you know, we have the possibility of seeing some really amazing skating from some of these like amazing younger ladies. I've just, it makes me so excited, not just for, you know, the future of the, like the rest of the season, but just like the future of the junior ladies field in general. And I'm just like, yes, I'm ready for all of my children. The theme of junior ladies is just gird your loins. Gird your loins, get ready for some crazy stuff. So our shout out of the week for this week goes to Ted Barton and all of the people who make the Junior Grand Prix possible with the streaming and the accessibility worldwide. They do such an amazing job every single year and just, you know, the dedication to showing all of these junior skaters and making it, you know, accessible for anyone around the world is just amazing. And I, we really cannot stress how much we value Ted and uh, everyone uh, in uh, Red Brick Sports who makes the streaming possible because it just it really just brightens up the whole early season. Thank you, Ted. We love you. Ted, we love you. Thanks for listening, and we hope to see you again for our next episode. Thanks to the research team for this episode, our transcribing quality control team, and Gab for graphic design. And thanks to Evie for editing. No problem. <laughs> and if you want to get in touch with us, then please feel free to contact us via our website, inlowpodcast.com, or on Twitter or Tumblr. You can find our episodes on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. If you enjoy the show and want to help support the team, then please consider making a donation to us on our coffee page. We'd like to give a really big thank you to all the listeners who have uh, donated to us thus far. You really helped us out with trying to get new equipment and funding our uh, podcast subscriptions and the website. It just it really helps a lot and we really thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all of your continued support. <laughs> and you can find the links to all of our social media pages and our coffee on the website. Uh, if you're listening on iTunes, please consider leaving a rating and a review if you enjoyed the show. Thanks for listening. This has been Evie. And Kite. See you soon. Bye, guys. See you at the Junior Grand Prix Final. Woo!